We would like to introduce to you a fantastic speaker. It's Michaela Magas. And Michaela Magas was awarded the title European Woman Innovator in 2017. And she is really an expert in the creative industry. She's working in and with the creative industries. And I'm really happy to have you here, Michaela, today at our Cross Innovation Conference. And if you have questions, just a short reminder to our audience, if you have questions now during the presentation of Michaela, go ahead and post them in the chat, please. And now a huge virtual and real applause, please, for Michaela Magas. Thank you. Thank you. That's, it's so nice uh, to be here. And thank you for this kind introduction. Um, I always say I'm in a huge position of privilege because I'm able to feed policy directly from grassroots innovation in the CCI, um, in the cultural creative industries. Um, and that's quite, quite rare because most of my colleagues in policy tend to be people who represent large organizations. Um, so to be able to represent a community, and I run a community that's now around 8,000, we have to do the final count now uh, after our latest event, which we ran, uh, believe it or not, during COVID um, in Portugal with uh, 45 people from 22 countries. Um, uh, basically, uh, having such a huge community to learn from, to be inspired by, and to be able to feed policy directly from that, that's quite unusual. Um, so, of course, uh, one of our uh, huge champions um, is, one second, because my slides are not moving, one second, we might have to boot out and reboot, oh, there it is, doing it now. Right, maybe we were locked. Um, so basically, uh, one of our huge champions uh, is uh, our wonderful commissioner, uh, Maria Gabriel. And this is, uh, uh, you know, for our sector, such a huge moment because there has been years and years of work in this sector of uh, ensuring that we are noticed that our contribution to society is really acknowledged and we have has this strong belief that we can uh, contribute to society uh, to a greater extent uh, to be acknowledged at the same level as all other domains of industry, for instance. And the fact that this has now happened and the fact that this is now a major uh, implementation in policy at the European level, this is a, a big step for us. Of course, it's also a huge challenge and it's something that we really need to uh, understand. We need to um, appreciate the fact that it's not a simple thing to be given uh, a big role uh, to uh, actually be at the center of cross-industry innovation. Uh, and I really truly believe that this is our role. And there is another uh, commissioner who is also very important for this. Uh, and for instance, this is uh, uh, Thierry Breton saying, the battle for industrial data starts now. Now, it might sound like this is not... Uh, relevant for the cultural creative sector, uh, or not perhaps as relevant as what Maria Gabriel is saying. However, uh, I can actually show you that the two are very, very strongly interlinked. And in fact, our job is to link the two. So we could actually look at it in this way, um, that our core supporting structures, the things that are currently kind of providing the scaffolding for what we are building, if you like, um, would be those. Uh, of course, technology. Technology is absolutely dominated by data. Data is dominated by semantics. Semantics is organized into ontologies, and ontologies are the way that we create meaning out of language. Uh, and language is the way that we create meaning out of culture, or you could say language is the main scaffolding that supports culture, depending on how you, how you look at it. Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, series of uh, terms because, of course, it connects technology very, very strongly to culture. And we know that techne, the word techne originally meant the art of making. That's where it comes from. Uh, the two are very, very strongly interlinked. Now, uh, the person that you have just uh, seen on that, on that photo, some of you might have recognized as, as Victoria Modesta. She's a fellow of MIT. She's a huge international star, champion of accessibility, champion of future technologies. And when our community grew really big and when we were doing Berlin with like, we had a community of 5,000, um, I really, really wanted us to be represented by a woman and I wanted us to be represented by uh, someone who is a champion of accessibility and who is uh, really courageous with new technologies. 
And Victoria is one example of uh, someone who combines together, you know, with all of our uh, creators from our community who help her do that, um, both technology and culture to create new meaning. So, for instance, in this case, uh, where you see her leg being adapted to a means of expression uh, as a device for expression rather than something that tries to mimic a human leg, um, this is a, a, a real uh, statement of something that is uh, completely changed in order to create a new meaning. So in this case, uh, Anouk Wiprecht, who's a fabulous designer, uh, created a leg that could do smoke, smoke for the stage. And the sort of visual image that you get from this is like that image of Marilyn Monroe with the, uh, her dress being lifted by, by wind, but in this case, it's the smoke that creates um, uh, the dress uh, together with the carbon fiber bodice. But one of the main things that has happened as a result of our labs and as a result of the engagement of our community is these huge human empowerment uh, exercises where, uh, in this case, uh, Victoria trained uh, via neurofeedback to be able to change the uh, lights on her outfit. And this is something that uh, is turning on its head uh, the idea that neurofeedback sensors are there to read data about a person and then be visualized. Instead, here, uh, the human is truly in the loop because the human is actually uh, training to drive the system through the neurofeedback. And she was able to do it uh, by the end of the week uh, of our labs. So we took this further to Rika Hanneman, who is... Um, blind singer and a vocal coach from the Sibelius Institute and fantastic person with huge vocal range, very proud to be a blind singer. Um, and with Rika, uh, this idea of uh, driving a system was turned by our uh, guys from New Arts into being able to drive the musical scale. So basically turning the brain into a musical instrument or a brain driving a musical instrument through data. And uh, um, what was extraordinary about this is that the system was being tested with everybody in the labs. This was during slush in uh, Helsinki. Um, and we opened slush with this uh, completely new um, ideas and technologies and prototypes that, that we'd, we'd created. Um, and everybody in the lab uh, started to train with this system to be able to go up and down the musical scale directly from their brain. And most people could do it after about two hours, uh, which is quite extraordinary in itself, because if you learn to play a musical instrument, it takes you a long time. Um, but then Rika put the neurofeedback um, sensor on and she was able to play immediately, instantly, without training. And what was extraordinary about this was that people who in the previous, um, let's say, mechanical era, when we didn't have digital um, uh, that draw uh, uh, digital and data-driven systems, uh, they would be considered, someone like Rika would be considered disabled. This was the word we used because she could not see the levers to move. She could not uh, see the machinery. Um, and in this system, she's actually far more talented than the rest of us. So this is a very, very important thing to remember. Um, we visualized her brain activity for the uh, audience, and this was uh, really wonderful in real time because you could really see, you could not uh, VJ, so to speak, with something like this. It, it's a, a definitely data-driven visualization. You can see how, how she is reacting. So what's extraordinary also about this is that the way that you arrive at such a solution is through all of these people being on stage together. And literally our band was uh, neuroscientists and computer programmers and uh, uh, people who run gaming companies, but they were on drums and those kinds of things. So um, this, is, this is the wonder, wonders of the cross-disciplinary uh, collaboration uh, in our labs. And this is why we treasure them so much because these breakthroughs are really what drives us. And this is, it attracts a tremendous amount of interest from companies and they support us. So this is, this is just some of them because we haven't updated it. But basically they go across different disciplines uh, or the different companies that support us. So of course, culture creative industries will be there first, software companies, tech companies, semiconductor because, uh, you know, our community is based, grounded in maker uh, sort of ethos, 3D printing, robotics, that sort of stuff. But if you look on the right... Actually, we go to 
things like automotive, lighting, primary industry. So what we're doing is clearly meaningful to them as well. And it is a space for uh, experimentation and for um, understanding the effect that technology has on human beings. And this is what happens uh, in our labs. So one of the uh, important things to, to, to remember is that when you bring all of these people into a space of common understanding, if you create a space of common understanding and you bring all these people in, what you get is a tremendous amount of value. So we calculated the value uh, of our Stockholm event, which had 800 and more um, uh, hands-on participants from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of uh, areas of expertise. So you're building an ecosystem that where you're exploiting uh, uh, really important and really well-evolved knowledge from individual knowledge domains. So in the industry, we talk about them as verticals. And we often criticize the fact that everything is in silos because, um, of course, uh, that prevents people from understanding each other because they've developed jargon inside these silos and the way that we organize language inside each silo is through uh, inventing more and more words that can describe this new knowledge. So, of course, this creates jargon, but um, it is valuable. This knowledge is valuable. And the fact is that already through building ecosystems, some of these verticals have started to disintegrate a little because some of the um, uh, words and some of the terms and some of the practice has become more permeable and especially in the platform economy we use the same systems so there has been sort of talk about vertic verticals disintegrating um, and it is useful only to an extent it's not useful for verticals to completely disappear because the knowledge would disappear with them so what is really important though is that culture then becomes permeable when when we start to join together across these verticals and of course, we know from the culture creative sector that when you join two uh, different cultures together, there's some amazing opportunities that come out of that. And we tend to exploit that as a creative sector. We tend to um, deliberately join uh, two disparate things in order to create something new. So we understand this possibly better than any other sector. And then, of course, if you now uh, look at this kind of... Um, compound of verticals that are possibly in part already kind of um, porous and, and, and already able to communicate to other verticals via platforms. And then you have culture that permeates all of this space. At the junction in between, you do get these new values. And these new values are really uh, incredible um, in our experience. So this is where some of the biggest innovation has been happening in our community. Uh, but of course, there are some things that one has to observe when creating these ecosystems. And this is um, transdisciplinary ecosystems. It's inclusion is number one. So if you're going to exploit really the junctions between completely disparate cultures, um, you really want to include everyone from all kinds of backgrounds. And this is our community, for instance, is some of, some of the wonderful photographs by a um, um, wonderful uh, creative person called uh, Andrea Grincerato, who's um, uh, one of our uh, members. Uh, and he took wonderful, wonderful portraits of our community. And this is just some of them, just to give you the, the, the range. Um, and of course, uh, across uh, different uh, modalities, different tools that we use, this is, for instance, us in New Zealand, uh, and you can see the the wonderful um, sort of combination of tools there. And um, uh, the guy on the right actually wanted to hack into his wonderful musical instrument, which we didn't let him because we didn't want to destroy it. Um, but this is the sort of um, uh, wonderful atmosphere and energy that gets developed also across political divides. This is us in Berlin, and we had to get a special visa for Ahmad to be able to collaborate uh, with Rani from Israel. Uh, of course, any age, we have three to 83, or someone argues even older now. Um, and this is our latest DJ in Stockholm. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, this, some of the wonderful, wonderful projects that come out that are to do with uh, new uh, empowering, enabling tools for accessibility, which affect everybody. And if you are uh, going to attend the breakout session later, I will tell you more about those uh, exact examples. But also, we're very, very active, we're proactive in making sure that the representation is really across the board. So for instance, in Stockholm, we deliberately put women in charge of 
all of technology areas. So from someone like Imogen Heap in charge of blockchain, she ran the blockchain lab for uh, the week, um, to Robin, uh, running, uh, who's in charge of Tecla for girls in technology, Anouk, whom I mentioned earlier, Danisa Kragic, big professor in, in, in AI and robotics, Kelly Snook, uh, ex-NASA for 19 years and then author of Mimu Gloves, um, uh, Nancy Bame from Microsoft Research, senior researcher there in charge of our academic community. Uh, LJ Rich from BBC Click uh, in charge of all of our uh, younger hacker uh, community and, and uh, Ginger Lee, an award-winning um, vi- uh, data visualizer and artist from, from Florida. So this is just an example, but uh, uh, I will actually uh, tell you later in the breakout session exactly the the result, because when we feed the results from these uh, uh, proactive um, uh, in, uh, interventions into policy directly, uh, and we get tangible results from that. So this is uh, something I can tell you about later. But then you put technology on top because you have these basic principles of inclusion. You make sure that you have a most diverse community. And then uh, you put technology on top and you unite disciplines. And for instance, we, here we use music as a social glue, which works beautifully. Um, I will stop for a minute and I will let you get the feel for um, how important the space for common understanding is for these people through a little video now. We are now 25 meters underground in Sweden's first nuclear reactor, now also known as the Cathedral of Science. conversations that happen, uh, the cross-pollination of different skill sets. I can speak easily, communicate easily in this kind of environment. So the interesting thing about MTF is that every year there's a theme. And we try to use that theme to help our development of that year. We chose uh, this uh, AI lab because uh, AI is uh, something that is inevitable. The first step is that AI is actually uh, a companion, right, for uh, humans and accompany human existence. There's a, a whole bunch of different projects happening, but what I see is a number of different uh, specialists interacting, trying to speak to each other. People here are like creating own stuff and creating new stuff. I was like, that it would be really cool to like see what they do. What I think can be interesting is the challenge, what human can already do. If it can expand our uh, boundaries of perception, if it can challenge us to be even more creative. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to see what comes out of it. So I hope you were able to hear that. Um, so the junction between cultures, as we were saying, of course, we are aware in the cultural creative sector that this brings new insights and new knowledge, and new values. As I say, we exploit it. But it, it's equally valuable between verticals. So in the junctions between verticals, in the junctions between the domains of knowledge, in the junctions between verticals in particular, now that we have this, uh, we're interconnected via data-driven systems, um, it does new values create, of course, new market opportunities. And new market opportunities usually mean emerging markets for new goods, new services. Um, and in knowledge domains, when we join knowledge domains, we create new knowledge. So, for instance, our academic community has been incredible at uh, uh, putting together a manifesto already back in 2014 uh, in strong belief that this is the way forward. This is what we should gather around, around this uh, area that combines uh, culture and technology, uh, where we are all enabled to give our contribution from the different knowledge domains. And so we created supporting structures that would support our community. And this is completely from observing what the community needed. 
um, we introduced particular interfaces that would lower the entry barrier to technology that would allow ideas to fly. Um, we have um, we cre uh, we ran pilots that would uh, have a series of test beds where they where we were uh, having new layers of intellectual property registered and later we developed it further. I will tell you in a, in a second. Um, we also introduced. I mean, as a part of policy, I introduced market adoption readiness levels and something that adds new dimensions to the technology readiness that is currently the norm uh, for measurement and that has been since NASA in the eighties. So. On its own, it, we felt it wasn't uh, good enough. We needed additional uh, measures there because uh, what we are doing uh, now is cheaper to deploy and lower on low on risk. And the amount of data we yield from that can really inform um, investments in in a particular direction. Um, just to give you, uh, uh, um, and for instance, one outcome uh, from our pilots. I mean, firstly, we, we thought we were going to get one or two good products out of it. We got 11 at the time and, uh, and we got uh, tons of papers that were a byproduct and we got a huge amount on social media and all this kind of stuff. But one of the sort of most salient things is that when you solve intellectual property and who uh, who's coming, who's going, so to, so to speak, sort of rules of the game, you end up with a much faster deployment um, to product patenting from a seed idea, really, really fast. And this is um, an example of one of the projects, um, which I will also tell you about, which actually took the cultural creative sector over to the primary industry. Uh, so basically completely across sectors. This is uh, what I mentioned that we have been experimenting further with intellectual property and how it is uh, registered. So here, for instance, we experimented with regi registering intellectual property in the blockchain while it's being created. So basically tracking and tracing in the chain the contributions. And people thought this would be really hard and it wasn't at all. Actually, it is. it really works and it has influenced some systems which are running now and we are actually developing this, this further, including... Um, uh, currently, the European Innovation Council marketplace, uh, which which is which has taken this on board, uh, but of course we're working with uh, frontier technologies, and so of course the usual bottlenecks exist, and proprietary IP is one of them. So this is where these ideas need to scale to an industrial level, and uh, and of course the uh, uh, problem with not enough data is linked to the proprietary IP, the fact that people don't want to de release it and uh, the lack of interoperability, which is another major challenge, and the fact that uh, most use cases uh, when using these technologies are really very unpredictable, and therefore it, they need to be experimented on to see what the effect is on human beings. So we scaled our methods into something called the industry commons. And I run the Industry Commons Foundation, and uh, uh, we're very, very proud to announce uh, uh, the first step in this. It's now a track inside the European program. Um, we uh, scaled our technology transfer toolkits to include technologies from, from across domains, uh, start to build these stacks of intellectual property on top of other people's capabilities, a little bit like you would do with open source, um, uh, in the open source community. Um, market adoption readiness, of course, that works for any kind of new breakthrough application that happens in between verticals. So we scaled these, and this is the Industry Commons Foundation. Some of these people had to have, uh, actually several of these had to have permissions from their governments in order to be part of the foundation. So I'm very, very privileged to have such a, a phenomenal steering board. Uh, and uh, uh, we are involved in the Industry Commons to set up the Industry Commons space for interoperability between different sectors also have contributed to the European uh, to the expansion of the European Open Science Cloud strategy, which is based on fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And uh, the European Innovation Council, as I mentioned, is taking on board this idea of a marketplace for IP. Now, this is our uh, starting project. We just had a, a kickoff meetings last, uh, last uh, week and this week. Um, it is the uh, basic uh, uh, starting point for making sure that we can speak to each other. And so it is creating an ontology-driven data documentation for industry commons. What does that mean? It means that it's actually looking at the different uh, languages that are being used and how they're being organized in different sectors. Those that are useful, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, knowledge in individual sectors is incredibly useful and it's related to a particular product or a particular device and, and it's connected to different terms in each sector. And at the level of domain ontology, i.e. for the entire sector, some of them have evolved the 
um, meaning mapping uh, systems. Um, so it's not the case of creating Esperanto here. It's a case of creating an ecosystem of ontologies that can bridge, um, an ecosystem that bridges between these domains so that we can understand each other, so that we can work together. This is our first step. Uh, but of course, data interoperability is, is a major challenge. And it's, as I say, um, there are some of us from the creative, culture creative sector who have scaled our methodologies in order to be able to assist industry in, in uh, creating these systems for common understanding. And data interoperability is not the only supporting horizontal here. Um, we need to, we have, we already have in some countries, for instance, like in Sweden, the financial services are totally horizontal in their application. But as I mentioned already, intellectual property needs to be managed across like this in a, in a similar way. And then again, the legislation and any legislation that's coming from the top, but also the smart contracts that are established between different uh, sectors also need to be uh, part of this. Um, and of course, we can embed into this any environmental monitoring, any, um, any uh, traditional targets towards the Green Deal, and of course, CSR and data ethics, because at the base of this horizontal system is society itself. Now, where, what's our role in this as culture creative sector? As I say, we really strongly contribute to this space for common understanding, and that sits on top uh, of this horizontal layer. And uh, 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 there is an unprecedented opportunity for us to reframe ourselves as a sector, as the sector that can create the value added on top of this horizontal system that unites all verticals. So we're talking now about sort of basically the what I would... Uh, name the new uh, EU common data market as in, as opposed to the com common market. Um, and this is uh, where we can really go for moonshots now because if we are able to operate across this horizontal space uniting all of these different verticals, then uh, uh, here's uh, Imogen Heap sending her voice to the moon in our labs. Um, a wonderful um, artist, Martin Nicole Rogina, had actually set up this system that is not scientifically a breakthrough of any kind, but it allows, uh, it, it is um, uh, really impressive in terms of its scale, and that is, um, you send your voice via the Dwingaloo telescope in the north of Holland with some wonderful um, astro uh, astronomers who were assisting us in this. 83 people sent their voices to the moon and they got the, the, the voice back. And of course, this is, does contribute to your sense of understanding and your, your uh, understanding of your position in the whole ecosystem. It, it does um, help revolve thoughts and um, give you, of course, an, a different kind of perspective. This is, as I mentioned, uh, uh, an example of where uh, a month ago, maybe six weeks ago or something like that, we ran, no, it's a bit more. Um, so we ran a lab with 45 people from 22 countries observing absolutely fully all of the uh, restrictions of COVID. And you can see everybody wearing our masks there that were specially um, uh, designed and made um, for, the, for the event. Um, so, um, the, um, basically, uh, we, our theme was another green world. Uh, it was a very, very interesting theme to take on board, uh, while you have this kind of, um, situation and it was literally COVID was exploding in Portugal around us as, as we were doing this. But not only that, we had connected to, um, all kinds of student groups in universities and also international collaborations. And I will tell you more about this in the breakout session, but I want to give you a preview of w some uh, work uh, with neural nets that uh, come out of that. And that's uh, by some amazing, amazing new artists. Um, and um, let me see if we can get the video up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michaela. 
That's your applause. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that was my final, uh, final bit. So, um, tell me if you have any questions. Happy yeah. to answer any questions. We, we are a little short on time, so I will choose one question from the chat to address to you. And if you have any further questions for Michaela, you can join her uh, breakout session later today. There's still a space, so you can register or just jump to the Zoom link. So I will read out the question to you. Technology, data, semantics, ontologies, language, culture. Is there, a pref uh, is, is there a preferred flow or direction through these layers to create innovation? Both, actually. And this, I'm glad that someone uh, asked that question. Um, both are actually valid. Uh, in fact, you can uh, create, when you do culture, when you create those new cultures at the junction, let's say you, con you connect two different cultures and it results in the third one in, in a new kind of cultural direction. Uh, this, uh, that was a sort of a later slide that shows you that you create new insights with this and you create new languages with this, in fact. So every time you join two cultures together, there, is, there are some new languages that come at that junction. And that does, in turn, create new meanings, and these new meanings will then in turn require new kind of ways to organize that meaning, and therefore it does work that way around as well. So you can, um, on that slide, it would mean a bottom-up approach, if you like, because that's how I stack them. I put technology at the top, culture at the bottom, but it could be left to right or whichever way around you want to think of it. Um, it's basically top-down and bottom-up, left to right, right to left. They work, they work together. So you can start from culture and from creativity and build towards a technological result uh, at the other end. Absolutely. 